Well, well, thank you very much for, for inviting me uh, to give a talk. Um, so the talk, I'll, I'll partition in, 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 in two parts. Uh, the first part will be very brief. I'll just talk about some Bayesian optimization that we try to do in the realm of chemical engineering, which we call real-time optimization. Uh, I just thought it would be a good idea to introduce this topic uh, and other, so that we, we could maybe talk about it later. And then the main part of the talk is the work based on um, Tom, Tom Savage work, actually. I'm going to be presenting that. Where is where we, we use basically Bayesian optimization to try to have a basically algorithmic way or driven way to design chemical reactors uh, using Bayesian optimization. And I'll, I'll be talking about that. Okay, so anyway, this is uh, it's my group. That's how we decided to call it, Optimization Machine Learning for Pro Systems Engineering. This is our, our little logo. Uh, we work on, on a variety of areas, just this, this areas in general. Uh, today, I'm going to mostly be talking about, I mean, data-driven optimization, basically. Basic optimization is part of that, and a bit of what we call design of experiments uh, kind of way. Okay, so first, I just, again, I briefly want to talk about machine learning in real-time optimization. And real-time optimization in what we call it in, in the chemical or process engineering space, right? So this is work, this previous work that we've done, this is work that actually has a few years, but I thought it's, it's something interesting to talk about, and these are the collaborators with whom I did this work uh, some time ago. So the main idea, and I know this, this is a bit of a busy slide, but is that we can imagine that in chemical engineering you have some kind of process, right, which we, you can just think of it as a reactor, right, and in a simplified way you have inflow, you know, things that you feed, temperature control that you want to have, and you want to optimize for some kind of product, right. Simply said, you have the input view, like in the control literature, we call the plant. The plant we call anything that we want to refer to as the real system. So this can be a reactor, this can be the whole, you know, things like distillation column, but also a whole operating plant, a chemical plant, and some others. We generally would write this in this left-hand side as an optimization problem, right? Where we want to maximize moving U. U is our control variables, and maximize some performance index. We have some plant constraints, right, which we definitely don't want to violate, and this is very important for us because this is temperature control, pressure control, things that your reactors can really, uh, it can blow up, right, basically. And basically here in this equality constraint, we have all the plant dynamics, basically, which is simply a mapping of our inputs to how our outputs, and then your typical bound. So this is a typical optimization problem. Now, I use a super script to say this is the, the plant measurements, right? So the real system, this is what we call a real system. You know, the way that you would solve this is you would do a model-based optimization, right? Like we all know where the optimization is practically the same. There's just two quite important differences. One here, Y, is not YP, because this is not the output from the plant. This is not the output from, from the real system. This is an output from a model, right? And this model I just call M, and it is parameterized by some parameters. This, this, this is using a model instead of doing experiments on your real system. Now, you will always have what we call plant model mismatch, which is the fact that you know, this model is imperfect to the, to the real process. Now, you know, this is what you would, in general, look at a graph. This is, and this is very traditional chemical engineering. This does happen quite often, where you have some starting point here, right? This is your initial best guess of some process that you want to optimize. This is where your model says the optimum is. This is where your plant says the model is, right? And as we all know, if you were just to optimize your model, and here I'm assuming that you're taking samples from your plant, right? Because you have measurements, you have online analytics, and you can be monitoring your plants. Um, you know, there's very this very famous saying in optimization that if your model has an error, your optimizer will find it, right? So that simply means that you will get to a wrong optimum because your model is wrong. Now, the approaches that we want to make and that, 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 that we talk, I'm going to very briefly talk about in this is, we're trying to design algorithms that as you sample the plant, so as you get real data from your plant, you notice that your model is wrong and you can, you know, make your way into the real plant sometime. Um, now, I'm not, I'm not going to go too much into this, but the typical way where people would do it, and this is, I think, what anyone will initially think who's trained in mathematics is you say, well, you do some parameter re-estimation. Right, so you have it's just a typical regression problem. This model is some regression, 
problem. You simply want to match your inputs and your outputs, right? Like you would do in super, any supervised training, basically. Um, I don't want to go into many of the details because it's not very important, uh, but we can talk about this later if not. But this will, if there is structural mismatch, so it's, the model is structurally wrong, if your equations are incorrect, which that's always the case, right? Because in chemical processes, you have transport phenomena, which you don't always account, fluid dynamics, which you don't always account. Generally, you always assume that you have 10 reactions when you really have 25, but only 10 are important. And modeling those 25, either you don't know them exactly or you know how, don't know how to calculate it anyway, here and there. So if you try to basically do a supervised learning to match this model to these outputs, it will not work. And you will actually go to a wrong optimum, and you can prove that mathematically, and you can do the case studies as well. And this is quite well known in the literature. So some of the work that we've done, again, I think this is something that they were known. This, this work we did it between 2017 and 2018 was we said, okay, how about we apply the typical discrepancy models, right? Which we now know very well, which is you add a Gaussian process basically to your error. Yeah. I'm not entirely sure what you mean with it won't work. It won't generalize well. I mean, if you, if you have training data, if you, if you, if you give it like rich enough uh, supervised learning model, it's going to be able to learn that uh, mapping from the training data even perfectly if you wanted. So what I'm guessing you're saying is that it's not going to generalize well. Yeah, so there's a bit of a, so if you, there's two things that you could do. One is you could put a null powerful or flexible model, like a neural network. And then like exactly like you say, you wouldn't generalize well. And generally you want to optimize in places that you haven't seen. Yeah. Um, that, that, that would be the machine learning viewpoint. In engineering, most of the time, we like rigid models. So we'd like, you know, equations that are not all flexible, like neural networks. And in that case, you would have the opposite problem where your fitting would be, you would say, I've reached the optimum also in my parameters. Um, but because your model is not rich enough to do the mapping. So there's a whole thing which actually what you would have to map is the, you know, the KKT conditions, the Karush Kuntopin conditions of optimality. Of optimization. It's actually quite interesting. It's an interesting problem. I, I didn't want to go too much into it because it detracts a bit. Well, not detracts, it's a different topic, but it's, it's an interesting. Yeah. But if you look at it from the deep learning point of view, like you say, you wouldn't generalize well and you generally don't sum. You want to go to places where you haven't sampled. Um, so what we do is we have, we have the discrepancy term, right? on the objective function directly, which is a Gaussian process, right? That's all that we do. And in this work particularly, we added trust regions. I know, so, so now trust regions are very common in Gaussian processes. This we did before, almost before there was any, any trust regions in it. So this was again between 2017 and 2018. And basically the idea here is that we're trying to create this kind of algorithm, right? Where even if the model tells you here that it's, it's the, model, the model optimum is here, you start from a point here, you want to have some kind of trust region where, it's where you know that you can trust your model. This blue stars are your initial samples. And you want to, as you go along, correct your model and find the, the optimal solution. Um, this, uh, I mean, obviously, this is not in, in, in a toy problem, just, just to show that. Um, what's very important uh, in our case is that we want to respect constraints. Right. Again, when, when you're dealing with chemical processes, it's very important that you satisfy temperature and pressure constraints. Um, and basically, in this algorithm, what we've done is we've done some kind of what we call distributionally robust constraints. Um, and we've used uh, trust regions also to bound how much our error is good and then, and then make predictions. Anyway, th this is one of the areas which we've, we've worked uh, in the past a lot on. I wanted to, to mention it. Um, because I thought it could be interesting because I know that, that people here work on this kind of thing. Um, yeah, and then anyway, we, this is a paper that was released later. So the, the first work here was done in, 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 a, in a conference and this is more a paper where we actually summarized all. But okay, anyway, that was a brief detour. Uh, and now I know that, that might've been a bit strange that I have a topic first and then the new, but this is the main topic that I want to talk about. Uh, which is basically reactor design will move fidelity based on optimization. Uh, Tom Savage is here and he'll, he'll talk at the end a bit about some of the latest uh, things that we've done. Um, uh, this is his work, so this is, this is what I want to be presenting and it's with collaborations from fluid dynamics people and people from additive manufacturing. 
Okay. So the idea is that so we are we're chemical engineers. We're trying to solve chemical engineering problems, right? And everything physical that you see has been manufactured by a chemical engineer, right? Like and everything, like everything from chairs, from clothes to tables to concrete, everything, right? So everything has gone through a process. So for us, it's very, very important that we fabricate chemical reactors and chemical reactors that can be efficient, right? That can transform your raw materials into products that we can use, right? That is, uh, now, the nice thing is that, you know, recently there's been a, um, a lot of work on additive manufacturing, right? This is basically 3D printing. And with 3D printing now, we can actually do new reactor designs easier, right? In the sense that now we, you can, I'm oversimplifying this, but almost draw something, put it into a machine and it gets it full, right? So it's much, it's different than what we had to do before. And that has led us to say, okay, maybe we can now have new reactor designs right, that can make our processes more efficient um, and drive our production. Okay, so how do people currently, right now, how are, how are reactors designed? So generally they're based on templates, right? So you want to create a reactor to, you know, have some reaction there. Um, it's based on a template that you already have. If you want to modify differently because the process is a bit different or you want to make it a bit a bit better, there's some engineering intuition and there's some human CFD interaction. CFD is computational fluid dynamics, right? Interaction. Where an engineer thinks of something, it simulates it, sees how it goes, and, and so on. And optimizing is quite hard. Although lately there's been people that have done it through through uh, fluid dynamic simulations. And the question here that, that, that we're asking and, and, and that we're addressing is: so can we do better? And basically what we're wanting to do is some kind of algorithm-driven reactor design, right? Where we have, for example, an initial design, right? And through Bayesian optimization, and I'll talk about specifically why we, we go for multi-fidelity Bayesian optimization, we can slowly design better, uh, better reactors, right? In a, in a closed loop way, basically, with interaction of, of basically the optimization algorithm and the CFD simulation. Okay, so in the talk, I'll, I'll, I'll be going through three main parts. So first I'll talk about reactor power education, then data-driven derivative-free optimization, which in this case is basically Bayesian optimization, and then we'll talk about the solution analysis and, and experimental validation. So first we'll talk about reactor parameterization. So basically you want a way for a computer to communicate with an, an algorithm that is creating your new designs. You want it to communicate some way that he wants to create a new reactor, right? Shapes and, and, and how are these going to affect? So for this, you need a parametrization, basically, right? You need a way for your algorithm to say, this is how I can move my reactor, and this is what I want you to design in a CFD simulation or later in some 3D printing. And basically, Tom came up with this uh, very flexible, uh, and, and I think, uh, Quite, quite interesting uh, parameterizations. Well, first you have the first parameterization, and these are parameters that we're gonna be optimizing over, right? These are the ones that our algorithm will be optimizing over. Um, these are things like, there's the basic one, which just defines the general form, which is the coil radius, the pitch, and what we call an, in, an inversion parameter, which basically tells you the general shape. Then we have the cross section, right? So generally the reactors, we're focusing here on tubular reactors, which is simply a tube. Right, and, and there's some liquid that goes inside and out. Um, but basically, uh, up, up, so far, right, you have simply a tube. And we're thinking, well, now actually that we have additive manufacturing and we can actually have algorithms that can drive this, can we actually make different shapes for the tube um, to promote mixing? Because this is very important, obviously, when you when you want reactors uh, reactions to happen. So there's a cross section and then the coil path, right? It basically tells you a bit more of the shape, and, and this is. Basically, this, this is how it's, it's parameterized. And Tom will talk a bit more about this. Your, your cross section is constant. Um, yeah, the, the cro so the, the cross section is constant. Uh, so the, the nor the area nor the volume is constant in the end base because of this cross section parameterization. But yeah, the general shape, the, the general yeah, yeah, uh, radius is constant. So one challenge I think uh, that we encountered with these kind of things is that. Uh, you could come up with various kind of parameterization, but it would be hard to know whether 
the design is manufacturable. Hmm. So is this here the design manufacturable or do you have to have some additional evaluation? So this is not, no. so, so this is something that Tom looked a lot into. So all of the designs are, are manufacturable. Yeah. And actually we'll show that uh Suppose, yeah, we, we we show that part of this has been designed. The others are with our collaborators right now, hopefully printing. Uh, but these are manufactured. So we can solve it as an unconstrained problem effectively by yeah. design. So so there's no there's no point in the input space where something is violated. So we like, haven't found it, or, or the design that we have come up with is not. Probably if we have uh if we would put an optimization that would try to use this parameterization to violate mm. something that we can manufacture, maybe it would happen. Yeah. Um, we haven't come across it. Uh, could it. Could it violate something else? Like, I don't know if you, you, you have a, yeah. a really tight pinch. Exactly, point, yeah. No sense the, the key thing is like intersections within the coil because then the CFD will just completely effectively break and it's unmanufacturable because you have sort of islands of, of yeah. resin. Yeah. Um, so I'll talk a bit more at the end, but we model things like the path as a discrepancy from a given coil path. Okay. So we're kind of deviating from something. I designed the bounds in such a way that we, we never have this. Yeah, overlap or something. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But I mean, it, there's interesting work in, you know, what happens if you could? I mean, yeah, would it be the end of the world? So. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And like, like everything, right? Like um, the work we will show it creates very nice results, but obviously there's always ways in which we can work with that. And this is a, this is some very, very nice things that are. And when you're evaluating it, is there any kind of stochasticity? Uh, I mean, do you, you know how reactors, chemical reactors work, but do you need to have, take like lots of measurements to actually get a, a robust estimate of uh, the output? So this is done in a simulation. So initially, we'll do we'll we'll talk about that. We do it on a, on a CFD simulation. Then we've printed the reactor and so on. But basically, that's a just one step validation. Let's say so we don't. Or at least we haven't yet come back because the fidelity to which we model it, the highest fidelity that we model it, is quite accurate. Uh, but but that, that's definitely a problem we can have. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay, so this is basically the, the parameterization, right? The modeling. And we also optimize operating conditions. Um, I, I won't talk too much about this, but basically we're optimizing basically the design and the operations jointly, right? Because uh, otherwise you're not comparing correctly designs, right? You want to optimize them jointly. Okay, so that's the parameterization, which is basically the modeling, right? So that's how we model our, our reactors. And then it's the, the optimization, right? which here is the, where multi-fidelity comes across. So something that could have done, right? And, and there's many people that have done it in Deligio, and actually people here have done it a, a lot, right? It's optimize some CFD simulation with some Bayesian optimization, right? That, 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 that would be pretty standard. Now the problem is that high fidelity simulations can be very expensive, right? Because again, you once you print the reactor, you want it to be, I mean, that takes a lot of time and effort and so on. So you want to simulate with very high fidelities at the end, right? For it to be asked. So it takes more than 12 hours, let's say. So the approach that we came up with is actually probably not surprising, having multi-fidelity in Bayesian optimization, right? Now, one of the interesting things here is that we have two different um, um, dimensions of fidelity, right? Which is one is the radial fidelity and one is the fidelity along the path, right? And you want to move them around uh, differently. Okay, so obviously different fidelities, right? Uh, some of them uh, take from 20 minutes to 12 hours, right? Some fast to some slower, and obviously some are more informative, right? And they can be biased or, I mean, probably lower fidelity will be biased, right? That, that's the main point. Uh, and they can also be noisy, but mainly bias is, is for problems here. Again, we have the actual fidelity and we have the radial fidelity, right? Uh, both of these are discrete values, right? But we've decided to model them as continuous values, right? Just because it makes the problem easier. Um, and I, again, I mean, obviously, we're assuming that from one delay to the others, we vary smoothly, right? That's why Gauss and Prius are, are a very good match. Um, we assume continuous fidelities, and again, we assume that obviously, the you know the these two sets are non-ordered, right? So you can't compare 
one fidelity with the other. Yeah, not in general. And that's why we want to handle fidelities in a, in a, in a multi-dimensional space. So there's lots of previous work, right? That has tried to address these kind of problems. So, sorry, good yeah. question about the previous slides. I'm not sure I understand why the fidelities are not ordered. So, sorry, the fidelity in each dimension is ordered. Okay. But the intersection between the radial and the actual fidelity is okay. it's not ordered. Okay. Um, so there's many, there's lots of previous work. I mean, we, we tried using deep Gaussian processes at some point. There's many other types of, of, of ways to use information. Um, we so we did a look at the literature and we didn't find anything that was tailored to exactly what we wanted, which is that we had continuous fidelity. Uh, we had again the, the the joint of the two fidelities is non-ordered, so you have to model them separately. You want to have tractability optimization. In this case, we don't have easy access to derivatives. So if you were looking at something like the pressure um, or other things, you could directly get via adjoint methods, right? The derivatives, uh, that's something that we could have, uh, so, but in this case, we're not doing that because after that, we're doing some kind of integration, which again, you could maybe now, uh, you have differentiable integrators and you could do it. We, we didn't decide to do it here. It would be an interesting add-on if we were to go to go that direction, uh, but we don't have derivative information here and computing time depends on the fidelities, but also on the reactor configurations and the operating conditions, right? Because I mean, people here know, your computing time is much, uh, yeah, can be much larger depending on how how your code decides to be or how your your geometry decides to go. Okay, so what's the approach that we decided to go with is we modeled with two different Gaussian processes. So one Gaussian process was the objective function Gaussian process, and this had as inputs the fidelities that just literally as an input and the x variable, which is the geometry and the operating conditions, right? So your decision variable. And then we had a different Gaussian process with the same inputs, but this one will, will model the computational cost, right, of the Gaussian process. And then the acquisition function, basically, that we would be solving uh, at every time is this one over here. So if, you know, this over here is your typical uh, upper confidence bound, but here we're interested in optimizing over our highest fidelity. Right. We're not interested in maximizing the performance of a medium fidelity. In the end, we just want to maximize the performance of the utmost fidelity with respect to the geometry. But we don't always want to model the highest fidelity, right? So, sorry, set, set dot here, we mean the highest fidelity. So our decision would not only be the operating and, and, and geometry conditions, but it will also tell us which fidelity it wants to choose. And for that, we weigh it by how much time, sorry, this is lambda here, and see here, this should be lambda as well. Yeah. So we weigh it by how much time it's going to take us to do this problem. Now, obviously, what we need now is some correlation between, OK, how much information I'm losing between the fidelity that I'm choosing, because I want to be low, uh, faster in time, and the highest fidelity that I want. And this is this term over here, right? which basically in, in includes the, the correlation, right, between the two fidelities. And this is basically a term that um, tells you the information loss between them. Yeah? So this whole term, basically, you could think about it as the actual uh, uh, objective function and the information loss, you know, basically penalized by how wrong can you be, right, given your, your variance or your correlation, and divided by, by the cost of time. And this is a parameter, gamma, which is, um, uh, a hyperparameter, which later will explain that we got some nice results with this, but definitely there's areas of improvement. I mean, overall, probably, but this parameter, we, we need to see how, how to tune it a bit better, maybe. Sorry, which one's the cost here? Is the lambda the mu lambda? The mu lambda. Okay. Yeah, mu lambda is here. It, that was my mistake. This no, is okay. lambda. Yeah. And, and then the other term on the bottom is just the correlation between your highest fidelity and exactly. the fidelity that you're considering exactly. right now. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. And because our cost is a function of our inputs as well, mm -hmm. we have to decide both of them in the same step. So we can't just decide the next reactor geometry and then trade off by just choosing the fidelity. So yeah. you've tried to capture it all in one step. Yeah, yeah. Because you don't know that if you you don't know what's going to happen at a particular yeah. fidelity. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um another way to optimize this, uh Tom has developed a very nice 
you know, multi-star gradient, you kind of gradient descent, like a, things of BFGS, right? Kind of, kind of yeah, yeah. that you have. Yeah, we can talk about the implementation as well. But, yeah. yeah. Uh, but so because obviously this is very non-convex, right? And I have lots of lots of local minimums. Okay, then the stopping criteria. Um, I would, I will try to be not too confusing about this, but basically, the last output from this algorithm, we want it to be a high fidelity simulation, right? Uh, because this this is saying, well, at every step you're going to evaluate some fidelity, but this will probably not be the, the highest fidelity. But at the end, we do want to have, we want to optimize the highest, have a, have a design for the highest fidelity. That's what we're interested in the, in the end. Uh, so final evaluation must be the highest fidelity. So do we have time? So this is something, um, so we optimize the mean function only, right, for the highest fidelity, basically, uh, because we don't want to do any more exploration. Um, and then at every time point, we basically use this cost function to say, okay, do we have time to do the new design that was asked plus this highest fidelity design at the end? And then we, the nice thing about modeling this as a Gaussian process, because we don't need to really, so far we just use the mean, is that we can add the variance here as well, like some kind of probabilistic, I mean, assuming that all of this follows good, but like, okay, with 95% confidence, we will be able to evaluate the current fidelity plus the highest fidelity once at the end. Okay. And the budget here is then uh, amount of time this time? Yeah. Yes, yeah, the budget is just an amount of time. So basically the, the, the big picture idea is that you, you know, the algorithm would work as follows. You create an initial data set, right? So it looks like this would some kind of design of experiments, right? This can be factorial or space filling or whatever side. Then you train the two Gaussian process, the objective function Gaussian process, the cost Gaussian process. Then you solve this optimization problem, which tells you which next configuration and operating conditions and fidelity to try out and check the time budget if this will allow for both. And then you do the CFD simulation, which I think Tom will talk a bit more about this is a combination of using open. This is the algorithm, obviously I won't go into it, but this is basically this one. Okay, uh, so now I'm gonna talk briefly about the, 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 the solution analysis uh, and experimental validation. So the first thing is that this very creative idea occurred to Tom after we had already asked for the first reactor to be printed. So the printed results that we have right now do not include this one. They just include the basic path from the core. And basically this was our, our optimal reactor. Um, Tom will talk more a bit about this and he knows, he knows definitely uh, the fluid mechanics better than I do. But here you can see that basically you're creating these vortices which allow for better mixing, right? So we printed this reactor, we validated it experimentally and we can see that it actually fits very well, the high fidelity uh, solution with the experimental validation. Sorry. Yep. What exactly are you plotting in this plot? So this is the optimal simulated solution. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So this is like a yeah. dimensionless concentration against dimensionless time. So in chemical engineering, it would be called a residence time distribution. And so you're simulating an impulse of concentration at the beginning mm. of your reactor and you're measuring it as it comes out. So our objective is to make this as tight as possible. So everything goes through the reactor at the same time. Um, and so, yeah, this match is basically across three experiments. We, we actually did put an impulse concentration and measured it and, and kind of matches with our CFD. Yeah. Can you, so here you're carrying out actual experiments, which essentially is another fidelity. Yeah. Yes. Right. And do you do you consider that as again you? Yeah. Yeah. I guess the time is much 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 higher. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I don't. I don't. Tom. Tom really likes to. He 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 he, he has very very similar thought process. Yeah. And this is what you were asking as well, right? But you, I, I think it's just so expensive that you assume that that's going to be your end goal. So you just got one shot. You just so one shot. Yeah. But you could you could do that where yeah. you could return them back. But if you had your own three D printer and you yeah, 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 set yeah. up in such a way where you can yeah. like 
turn over one every other day or something. Absolutely. And then maybe you're at the point. Yeah. Well, the really great thing is with the resin 3D printers, the time taken to print multiple ones, the time is just a function of the height. The height. Yeah, yeah, because it's just a well, right? So then you have high throughput, effectively. Okay. Um, and this is something we haven't we haven't really done. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Implementation-wise, there's a lot of work to go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You no longer just sat at a computer, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I don't really understand the value or the meaning of one shot. What happens if your one shot is wrong? Yeah. Then it becomes a two shot, right? Yeah. Or, or it becomes failure. Um, why, why bother in doing this one shot even? Because it can't change what you're going to do. Or will it change what you're going to do? So we, we would assume that this is... So the, the the way that we think about it is that you design a reactor and that's the one that you print and that's the one that you will use in your process plant. Obviously, you would first check that it actually does what you thought it would do. Here, what we were checking is that also, well, okay, like we printed, we say that this is a very good reactor, but then we want to check that our experiments also match what our predictions say. I don't know if that was the... Yeah, no, it's, it's so, just like reading it out. So it's, yeah, it's pretty well, good. It, it's it's a, I think it's a zero shot. It's a zero shot optimization. Yeah, like yeah. if it's right up line, yeah, yeah. you can't yeah. you can't act on the results of those. Yeah, no. yeah, yeah, yeah. throw away whatever you've done. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Yeah, we, we're drawing our system boundary around the simulation basically, um, mm -hmm. and we're using this as a nice kind of. We're showing that it does match with our simulation, but in an ideal world, as you say, we would include this as part of decision making. Yeah, there are a whole host of issues with you know this is this a continuous of the high fidelity is it you know there's, there's yeah you get into categorical fidelities and things so yeah, yeah. well yeah we'll talk about that in a minute yeah yeah but that's another thing that we should talk about i think this is a good okay so then later someone came um up with this very very creative way of okay now how how do we do this uh, so, sorry we, can, can we change also the cross section and this is the final so in this case what we said is okay let's start with a double helix basically like you know like as your prior let's say right and then optimize it uh and then we have this illustration where okay this is if you had only optimized the cross section like uh, parameterization that's just for visualization purposes right and this is as if you had only optimized it um, call path, and then this is when you when you have them both together. Um, and this is the, basically the one that we uh, want. Well, our our, our collaborators, uh, Jonathan, he's he's hopefully printing it. <laughs> um, okay, so, so just you're going through some some brief. Uh, it's a question. Uh, yeah. It's a question. It's on on the on the previous slide. So where. They, 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 those look. Was that just from a single optimization? You've segmented the two contributions because that. Yeah. It, it looks like they linearly add or something. Yeah, yeah. So we, sorry, yeah, yeah. So we didn't optimize just this, and this yeah. is that design, and we didn't just optimize this, and this is the design. Is we optimize this one, and then we see how it would look. Um, yeah, it's true that definitely they would probably be slightly different to very different. With the with the combined parameterization, we took the optimal solution for the path and then fixed those parameters and then optimized the cross section. So we are kind of doing a heuristic mm -hmm. kind of fixing decision variables because um, otherwise the problem is too high dimensional takes a long time. and takes a long time. And, and we felt like this was kind of a robust way of doing it in a sense. Yeah. Do you reckon you get the same answer if you reverse your? Um, probably not. Good point. Yeah, I, I, probably not. Whether we took the the top one on top right and then optimized the the path, I don't mm -hmm. think so. Um, mm -hmm. it, it's more for visualization purposes. I think this is not definitely a. Yeah. yeah. We will actually go to some some of those challenges uh, actually because. Uh, Okay, so let, let me, I'll, I'll, so, okay, well, I'll, I'll talk about this, but, so basically we have a very, very high dimensional space, right? We're in a hundred dimensions, basically. Um, and probably, I think you, you probably do a bit more, you know, have a hundred dimensions. Obviously there's many ways to deal with how many dimensions, right? Um, something that we've thought about and that would be cool would be some kind of dimensionality reduction linked with 
uh, Bayesian optimization, obviously the things that you could take out some parameters, see how they correlate and just choose some of them. Um, but that's one of the directions that would be interesting, interesting to explore. Because obviously you want a very rich parameterization, but the richer, the larger the problem becomes. Um, so this is a plot where we show frequency of evaluations. So here we have on the x-axis, we have the actual fidelity, and on the y-axis, we have the radial fidelity. And the main thing that I want to point out here is that the radial fidelity is sampled more or less uniformly. So we are sampling the radial fidelity quite well along both. However, the actual fidelity, we're sampling a lot on one side. So we're basically we're penalizing too much higher fidelities. This has to do with many things, but partly with the parameter lambda, which is one of the things we want to look into because we would want broader algorithms to sample a bit more higher fidelities. Um, that, that's obviously a hypothesis, right? It might be that just this is just the richest combination that you can get, but that, that, that's one of the retention process. Um, then we have this plot where we plot the different um so 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 this is a dimensionality reduction of our parameter space and we want to see basically if our optimization is following some kind of path right so there's, there's we have no way to saying that yes these points are better than anything else that it's that, that that is here or here but what we can see is that our initial factorial design when we do some tsne uh dimensionality reduction for visualization they all fall within some distribution over here and as we move we do end up on a different distribution which seems to be i don't know if optimal probably not but at least better than the one that we have here uh, again this is not telling us anything about optimality but the fact that we do follow some kind of path for the optimization and sorry to just mm -hmm. add something to that the reason we have to do that to gain insights is because the the lower fidelities in this case are significantly biased so they consistently give higher objective values than high fidelities mm -hmm. because your mesh is is larger and your tracer is just way more uniform um and so it's difficult to actually gain a sense of whether things are progressing at all cool because um, especially if you're evaluating lower fidelities yeah, yeah, so yeah, yeah, yeah. this this is into space only yeah so we haven't added anything. This is just um, just the parameters of the geometry. Something a bit puzzling in this graph is your initial design is grouped in one part of the space, yeah. while like primarily space filling. So A should be a bit everywhere, and then you would concentrate and follow a path. Can you explain why A is grouped? So I I don't know if Thomas I can't. I think it's, I think it's, so this was one of the interesting things that we got out of the, yeah, of the, that we were like, okay, it seems like there is, because our intuition was the same, was like, well, uh, I mean, we're in a hundred dimensions, so we, so, you know, I don't know how, how, because Disney is also, it's not, a, so if it was like some PCA, mm -hmm. right, that's a linear dimensionality reduction, there is no reason why we would have exactly that. There's no reason why we could have a space filling in one. I don't have the in enough intuition, um, but this was something that we thought was worth showing. Yeah. yeah, I think it, it might be to do with just the dimensionality of the problem and and the fact that we're whilst we're space filling, um, there's still going to be our initial data set is about 25, 26 solutions, I think. So um, there's still going to be huge areas that we've un unfilled. Um, and that's just the consequence of the parameterization. I think we just thought we'd see, uh, you know, open up the design space to see what we got really. Okay. So basically, these are the two the two preprints that we have so far. So this one is the one where we explain the algorithm and, and the results and so on. And this is where our uh, CFD collaborators basically really tell us, we uh, really explore what's happening. Um, Tom has been very involved in that, so he, he can be able to tell you a bit more. I'm definitely not an expert on, on CFD or fluid flow. Uh, and here is the GitHub, so we, we have all the code there, so you can also 
you know, for reproducibility purposes, play around. Um, Tom, you have this figure, right, on yours, where you talk about this, because I thought... It was... um, maybe I... Yes, I do, I do. Okay, I'll, I'll let you talk about it. Yeah. Um, okay, so in the end, you know, the, the, basically the, the, the main takeaway is that the abnormal methodology seems to work very well to produce good results. There's certainly lots of challenges around some that we thought, again, we're doing in high dimensions. Um, other fidelity that might be important, you know, or sorry, other parameters would be solver options, right? This would be categorical. How do we move around them using discrete continuous fidelity? I mean, there are algorithms there that can do this, but how do we incorporate them? And further analysis of solution, which would enter, for example, in what you're saying that, well, this picture is something that we found and it was very pleasant surprise, but we haven't gotten deep into saying, okay, why is this what the dimensionality that allows us to do this, the reduction? Okay, uh, that was it, basically. Tom, um, should I pass it on to you? So yeah, sure. give now a bit more analysis on there. So I'll just talk a bit more about uh, what we, we found in, in the new reactors. Um, it's, I think fundamentally, <laughs> I think fundamentally here we're dealing with, oh, is it shared? Uh, I mean, you need to share it, yeah, sorry. Yeah. I, I, I put three proof in on mine, but I share it. So I think fundamentally we're, we're doing this um, for the purposes of discovery, really. Um, so we're, we're trying to identify what kind of features might be interesting in, in new reactors. So I'll just talk about a bit more about what we found. So we have our cross-section parameterization here. I've just plotted some examples of some cross-sections as we go along the reactor, which we interpolate between. Um, and again, with the with the cylindrical coordinates, so we're, with the coil path, we're interpolating in cylindrical coordinates. And as I mentioned earlier, we do this as a deviation from a nominal coil. And so this means that we have feasibility throughout our entire design space, um, which is useful because we don't have to model constraints. And so some details of the simulation. Um, with the extended parameterizations, with the coil path and the cross section, we actually wanted to remove the operating conditions as a design variable and treat this as a steady flow problem. And so the problem here is, can we recover similar behavior as our pulse flow conditions by using the geometry of the reactor? So as I mentioned, um, earlier, we're looking at residence time distributions of these reactors. So we want these to be as tight as possible effectively. And for example, in a polymerization process, um, as your chain lengths are growing throughout your reactor, you want these all to be effectively the same length um, because then your, your plastic or, or what you're producing has the same properties and it saves on downstream separation costs. So Antonio presented uh, these reactors here. So we have the optimization of the cross section on the top right, the optimization of the coil path, and then we've combined them by fixing the coil path here. And so I think where this is interesting is what can we learn from, from these? I don't think, well, we hypothesize there are other optimal solutions. There might even be um, solutions with the same performance, of course. But what can we learn from these specifically? So we found that with the cross section, the reactors had this characteristic expansions and contractions throughout the reactor. Um, and when the reactor was, the cross section was expanding, we have a horizontal pinch almost. And so we plotted some streamlines and we showed that what this does is it forces the fluid on the outside of the reactor, so closest to the wall, which is the slowest moving fluid, it forces it to curl around and towards the middle. And the middle of the tube is where the fluid is moving fastest. So um, this actually provides mixing effectively. And so you're not just having fluid that's slowly moving through the walls throughout the whole reactor, but it's getting mixed by this, um, these pinches and this expansion to contractions. And with the, the coil path, on the top here, we plotted fluid entering at the center of the reactor. So this is fast moving fluid. And on the bottom here, we've plotted 
uh, fluid entering near the boundary layer, so slower moving. And, you know, these are all hypotheses, but we can see that the fluid closest to the boundary layer is taking a kind of shorter path here. So it's almost taking a shortcut. And the fluid at the center is kind of going up and around. And so fast moving fluid taking longer and slow moving fluid taking a shorter path. We anticipate the balance out and we can also provide everything going through at the same time. So the question, can you measure whether they balance out, but like look at the time at which it entered and exited yeah. and the time at which it's entered? Definitely, we could definitely do some, some measurement. Of that. Yeah, yeah. So we're kind of capturing, that would be like the latent information. We're kind of capturing it all in terms of just the residence time distribution. Uh, and so this is our like single objective. Um, but absolutely. So we have equivalent graphs here where we've plotted the velocity and we could definitely do that. Um, so we're kind of like discovering insights effectively from these solutions. Uh, and one exciting thing that we found was in our joint parameterization, um, we found the presence of these beam vortices. Um, and so these are attractive because you're, you're mixing the fluid radially. Um, so you're mixing all this slow and fast moving fluid together. Uh, and normally you have to induce these using pulse flow conditions, but we managed to do it just through the geometry of the reactor here. So on the right here is just a standard coil with a steady flow. And on the left is our optimized configuration. And we have these, these vortices. So we have some more dimensionality reduction. I think you could probably find um, any, any correlation you wanted to out of these plots. So I won't talk too much about them. Um, but we, we took the features and we took the insights that we, we discovered and we extrapolated these to, to longer reactors and, and these are the designs that we have that, that are being 3D printed as well, because um, we expect there, if we were to optimize the parameterizations for these long reactors, we would expect a lot of symmetry in the solutions. Um, we would expect the cross sections to repeat. So we optimized them for, for two coils and kind of extrapolated using our insights, these final designs. So I think that is where we end. Just a, just a super question, like um, what's the volume of what, one of these? The volume, wow, I should have bought it with me. A, so the, like, I've got one. Um, like, I don't know, 10 meters or like? Oh, it's very yeah, okay. So these, these are what we call meso scale. Hmm. So macro, uh, micro scale, microfluidics, you're talking about, you're getting really strong mixing effects, really good heat transfer. And that's why microfluidics are becoming increasingly prevalent. Macrofluidics or traditional reactors, kind of the size of this room. Yeah. Uh, the fluid effects are difficult to control. So you need stronger mixing. Um, but micro or macro, what are we talking about? Mesoscale reactors kind of combine both. We have higher throughput, um, but we also have kind of attractive mix. So, so in practice, people are moving towards lots of parallel meso. Yeah, so this would fall under the, the, the field of flow chemistry, effectively. So in labs, people are, are doing more of this mesoscale experiments, online measurements, online controls. Um, in terms of industrial processes, um, I'm not sure. I think these would probably be most used in something like a pharmaceutical process where you're producing on the order of a kilogram of, of product a year. Um, I see, yeah. Yeah, so we're just looking at... Not, not for mass production. No, unless you run these in, in parallel. Yeah. Um, yeah, exactly. Uh, arguably, you could have this, the same procedure for bigger, but then we wouldn't have anyone to print it, basically. Yeah, yeah. No. So it, by doing it mesoscale, it fits together with the printing and, and everything. So is, it, is this just that you mentioned that you were just looking at a couple of coils? Mm -hmm. Is is this size, is that a couple of coils or is that a generator of...? Yeah, so something around sort of 10 centimeters, you're looking, it would, would be one of these designs here. Okay. So if oh, I don't have the 3D printer, but um, <laughs> the one that we optimized with just the, the small coil here is about not very useful for um, Yeah, so we're we're looking to to have a tractable problem um, that we can generate insights from, and then we extrapolate those insights into something that we could probably use um, and actually get experiments out. So, and that's a <laughs> so actually, yeah, so we, there have been experiments done by Jonathan and he's found that the tanks and series, which is our objective, it changes linearly with the number of coils, which was another reason that we, we just chose two. Um, 
we felt that we could simulate the, the results there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sam? I mean, I guess, I guess so, like, you're even, even, uh, like, the, I can't remember what those charts were called that you were trying to make, like, peaky is, that's kind of like a, a, a metric on, you know, some, some, some way of quickly estimating how good these things are, but, like, I guess what what is it that you ultimately care about when in these designs like is it cost per unit chemical or something can like how, how do these translate to that and do, do you yeah yeah be able to test that or is it just like you've got to assume it because it's too difficult to test yeah so a, a valid field of research in chemical engineering is superstructure optimization so doing these types of optimization problems. But as you say, treating the objective as my overall plant costs, so my, my capital costs, my operational costs, um, then you go into multi-scale problems and they, they generally become quite intractable. So for us, um, we associate the costs of the process with this residence time distribution, because if it's more spread out, then I have a higher distribution of products. And so I have to put in more effort in my downstream separations to separate, separate out all of the, the reactants that haven't reacted, for example. And so, yeah, we're effectively what we care about is the fact that all our fluid goes through at the same time. Um, and that's characterized by a number of equivalent tanks in series here, which just characterizes um, the distribution. Uh, and this is what contributes to the fact that it becomes a bit more difficult to evaluate the gradient because we're performing a simulation. We have this residence time distribution, and then we're characterizing that distribution with this relationship to find our objective. And, and a bit of on that, I'm just going to repeat a bit what Tom said, but basically, depending on your process, you would want to have it would be more or less costly to have some distribution, some residence distribution time. So maybe if you had your optimal residence distribution time. Right, because you want to have, you don't want to put too much effort into the reactor. Maybe because maybe the separation is cheap, that can be a case. You can also have where the separation is very, very expensive. So you really want to push it as much. So it, it, it not depends on what process or what, what chemical you're, you're, you're producing, basically. But the procedure would be the same, basically, or, the, or very similar. The, the yeah. What was the objective? Uh, here was it the uh, width of the uh, residency distribution yeah so effectively the residence time distribution they all integrate to one because you have a fluid and impulse and everything has to come out um it's effectively the width yeah okay. um these are all we call yeah these are all symmetric distributions just as a result of the model that we we're using to characterize them um we could also penalize non-symmetric, non-ideal distributions as well, if that's something we were interested in. Um, so, so the one on the left here is, is better than the one on the right. Yeah. Gee. Uh, yeah, I guess on the parameterization, you mentioned uh, you started with a, a design and you did deviations. Um, I guess that was to stop getting like invalid geometries. Uh, and like to set those ranges, obviously you have to like set a range for those each of those parameters that you deviate from. Did you ever find a situation where the optimum was sort of at the limit of that range? Are you suggesting that you should have, you could have, like, if you've gone further, you would might find a better design? Yeah, yeah. We actually found a kind of adversarial solution in that if you look at our coil path, the kind of height axis, the coil actually ends up going down again, um, and this is a kind of quirk of of the parameterization we used for the cylindrical coordinates. Um, so maybe this is something that, that is promising. Um, this isn't behavior that, that I designed the parameterization to have. Um, I think it was a quirk of the fact we're doing quadratic interpolation and we're potentially getting some kind of effect here. Um, but yeah, it would indicate that opening, up, opening it up even further could result in some, some interesting solutions. Um, potentially even allowing the coil to intersect itself might have some, some effect. So, yeah. 
Yeah. So isn't the reason you have a high dim dimensional problem, the fact that you, you're parameterizing with a GP, which I guess is you're having control points out of the profile, which is two parameters per control point, and you want 50 of them, so you have 100 parameters, which is possibly overkill to get these kind of shapes. Yeah. Maybe not, maybe it is what you need, but uh, can you comment on that? Yeah, so we kind of cut our dimensionality of the cross section in half by fixing the um, the rotation of these coordinates. So we just have six evenly spaced um, points that define a cross section, and we're only changing the radial values of these. Um, so here we have six sets of, of cross sections that we interpolate between. So in this case, we would have 36 parameters effectively, um, which isn't so bad, um, but it's kind of, this is a modeler's decision effectively of how, how, um, how odd do I want my reactor to look effectively? How small? Yeah, and it's, it's not constant over, over the entire space. So you have six cross section you're interpolating from one to the next. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so then 36 is not that big. Yeah. So in, in this, for example, if I can use the, the laser pointer, but you've got it exactly. So we would have uh, a cross section here, for example, that's yeah. fixed, and then a cross section down here that's fixed, and we're just interpolating between them. Okay. Um, and that's how we get closed continuous reactor because we don't want anything to, to leak out. Yeah. I think we're almost out of time or out of time. Perhaps uh, some last question. Perhaps I, perhaps I can, uh, well, we don't have the slides now up anymore for the acquisition function, but uh, is, is it uh, common to uh, in UCB rule to include the uh, multi-fidelity in the denominator? And what's the rationale for that? So we've talked about, so someone I have talked about it, that my, our intuition would be to actually have just multiplying the correlation on top, right? In, in the top, because you have, you have the acquisition. So, so that was not our, we took it from one of the papers and basically their argument was that then it had, I don't, Tom can correct more, but this had an information interpretation, right? Like the loss of information. Um, I mean, if you have a, if, if you have a covariance, it's also like, it's more like an uncertainty interpretation. Okay. Again, this is more a loss of information interpretation. Um, yeah, there's a paper that describes it much better than I, than I could. But, but yeah, basically, that's the idea. Yeah. I'm, I'm curious about the, the model that you were using for the multi fidelity. You were, you essentially just included an extra input dimension for the dimensionality. Mm -hmm. Was that sufficient? And did you try anything else? Because it's a, it's a slightly restricted assumption, or maybe not the most efficient mm -hmm. method of sharing information across mm -hmm. fidelities. Yeah, so we felt like that would enable us to capture the information continuously. Yep. Um, as I said, in, in this case, the lower fidelity simulations were significantly biased. And I, I got the sense, at least, that at lower fidelities, the objective function had less variance and it was consistently high because you're getting distributions that are very tight because you're not capturing much of the fluid effects in the vortices. Yeah. Um, so in that sense, our fidelity dimension in our GPs is modeling something that goes from relatively high length scale to a, a kind of more detailed high fidelity function. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, we, we felt like it captured the information well. I think if you were to go to three continuous fidelities, um, you're starting to potentially lose the insights and, and you're not gaining too much. Um, but it's something we could definitely, definitely try. Um, and we're looking to kind of improve it further with the modeling of the cost and, and things like that. So, um, yeah, there's, there's tons of things we could try. Oh. Okay, let's, uh, let's call it a day here and we can continue the discussion uh, in the lunch. Okay, thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.